The amount of data is just staggering. It's in the air right now, streaming around us. Every part of your life can be quantified at this point. Just about everything from medicine to sociology to AI as data, it's a revolution. We're not just coming up with new ways of collecting data, but we're coming up with new ways of thinking about data. I'm a climate scientist. I develop advanced and often cutting edge statistical methods to analyze complex data sets. I deal with disease epidemics, trying to forecast the spread of Ebola in West Africa. One of the things that I study is networks and the mathematics of, of social networks. I'm interested in both the mathematical foundations of data, but I'm also really interested in lots of applications, in particular medical data. In life sciences, there are so many things you can discover from those massive data. But how to analyze those data becomes a more pressing challenge. The exciting thing is really how math and statistics are all coming together to solve problems. In some sense, the explosion of data science is exactly what has motivated the creation of a data theory major. This major is a partnership with the math department and the statistics department to be the other side of the coin that complements the application of data science. We really wanted to distinguish ourselves as being focused on a foundation of theoretical techniques. We really want to understand the underpinnings of what makes these technologies work. We need statistics to think about uncertainty in data. We also need mathematics to solve some of those complicated optimization problems so that can help us have faster and smarter solutions. You're going to learn all of those sexy topics. You're going to learn about the machine learning models. You're going to learn about the data science models. The additional thing you're going to gain from the data theory is you will be able to answer the why questions. Do you want to be somebody that builds robots? Or do you want to be somebody that understands how robots work and why they work, and then go also on to build robots from the ground up? Students in this program can expect to study lots of math at an advanced level, computer programming, optimization of algorithms, lots of data analysis and data visualization. We've created several new courses that are almost unheard of to require in a data science type major. A mathematical modeling course methods of data theory, and a very important one is data ethics and how it fits in with society. We want to train scientists who can be the leaders in this field. The world of data and data-driven approaches is just growing so fast. If you just learn what's currently being used, you're already going to be behind. Whereas our major in data theory gives you the foundation to be able to learn to innovate, to adapt to future things, to be the future, and be at that forefront. I don't know what you think, but I think that video is really inspiring. I've seen it a few times, and every time I, I find it really compelling. I want to thank you all for joining us for our first Data Theory in the World Seminar event. Today, today's panel features six leading scientists in, in various industries. My name is Miguel Garcia Garibay. I am the Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences. Uh, I am one of the uh, biggest fans of the stats and math departments, and uh, it is just a pleasure to welcome all of you here today. In my role as dean, I have the privilege of working very closely with the entire division of physical sciences. I'd like to brag a little bit about that. So, in addition to statistics and mathematics, which are two amazing departments, physical sciences also has the Departments of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, Chemistry and Biochemistry, Earth Planetary and Space Sciences. Mathem um, well, mathematics is represented already, but Physics and Astronomy. And guess what? All of these departments uh, produce vast amounts of really incredible data, and they are really, as all of us, very interested in, in learning more about the principles of data science and data theory. Um, as you know, UCLA has a really strong, long-standing tradition in both teaching and research. Being a research university, that makes us very different and very unique, right? That our students, yourselves here, have an opportunity to interact with some of the brightest faculty who are developing and really pushing the, the frontiers of each of the disciplines. So it turns out that <clears throat> 
Um, this is a particularly interesting and, and unique uh, uh, situation because we have a, a really exciting a new uh, major, the data theory major, that brings together mathematicians and statisticians to work together in the foundations of data science. At UCLA, all statistics faculty are data scientists with a wide range of application fields. In mathematics, data science is well represented by several faculty members in its applied mathematics group. Now, the data theory major focuses on the fundamental concepts needed to model data and to make sense of data. It is this foundation that allows for the fullest and best application of data sciences. Graduates will come away prepared to be leaders in industry and in academia. Today, we will hear from six outstanding leaders in data science, including one of our very own mathematics alumni. Our panelists today are members of our Data Theory Board of Advisors, who are advancing the mission of data theory at UCLA, as well as guiding us on curriculum and innovative ideas and opportunities to help our current students envision the endless career opportunities they, ha they have with a data theory degree. With that, it is my pleasure to invite our moderator for today's panel, Professor Mark Hancock, who will discuss the distinctive features of data theory at UCLA. Mark. Thank you very much, Dean Miguel. So what is data theory? In understanding what is meant by data theory, we first must un understand what is meant by data science. Data science is a, is a science of how we learn from data. People have been learning uh, from data for a very long time, but the computer revolution and automatic data collection uh, has transformed the world and how we learn about it. Most data science programs focus on teaching students the methods of data modeling and analysis. They focus on the tools and techniques of data engineering. What is missing is a rigorous understanding of the statistical and mathematical concepts that are the foundations of these methods. Without these concepts, data scientists can lack the understanding to deal with real world problems. They may know all the words, but they might not know what they really mean. So what is data theory? Data theory is the mathematical and statistical foundations of data science. For most students, the most direct connection with data theory will be the data theory major. As the video shows, it focuses on the rigorous foundations that underlie the tools of data science. Students now have two choices. They have their statistics major, which is a de facto data science major, and now they have the data theory major, which prepares students for graduate school in a data discipline or a leadership role in industry. Data theory at UCLA is the first in the world in name and content. UCLA is a leader in this area. We are here today to introduce the data theory advisory panel. They are a diverse group of professionals from industries that have been transformed by data science. Their role is to keep us connected to the developments in the real world so that we know where data theory needs to go. Uh, this will be a first in a series of seminars uh, in the world seminars uh, in the future. Today's topic is how data drives business decisions. So let's meet the panellists. Please, please come forward. So we'll start with the panellists introducing ourselves uh, from stage right to stage left. So we'll start with Michael. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> My name is Michael Gilling. I am a strategic data advisor. Uh, I have a technology background, uh, studied chemical engineering, and I've had a long career in technology. I feel fortunate that when I entered the workforce, uh, the internet just really started happening and a lot of the technologies that, <clears throat> that probably people take for granted, a lot of it got invented and happened during the course of my career. 
Uh, I advise a few companies now. Uh, we build data companies for a number of uh, clients. I had a long career at JP Morgan Chase as CTO of the data business unit. And I was also a CTO of a data company uh, that sold data to uh, Google, Facebook, um, data in the anti-money laundering space. So I've had a pretty interesting um, dance with data uh, over the last 20 something years. Happy to be here. Michael, you <laughs> Michael's already making me feel old because I definitely started working long before the internet was rolling. So. <laughs> Um, good, good evening. My name is Pramabhat. I am the Chief Digital Officer at Ulta Beauty. Um, just a, two minutes about Ulta Beauty so you have a context when we talk about it later. It's a beauty retailer, um, hair, skin, makeup. Um, and for sure, obviously, our key target segment is women, but you'd be surprised. Uh, everybody needs uh, skin, hair, health, hair, ha hair help, skin help. Um, and everybody's got a mom, a, a sister, an aunt, uh, a, a daughter, a, a, you know, someone in their life that, ca that can relate to what we hope is the power of beauty and the lives that it changes through um, self-expression and, and, and confidence and allowing everyone to be their best self. And so that's a little bit about what Alta Beauty is. We have about uh, a little over 1,300 stores. I'm excited to talk to you about how data and data science sit inside of a beauty and retail company, um, which you know you might might be, be a little unexpected. Um, it definitely is for me. I never thought somewhere in my career I would go full circle. So I started out my career um, in engineering, uh, spent my first decade in the auto industry, um, uh, also have a little bit of background in business, uh, spent a couple years in management consulting, and then have spent the last 20 or so years in, in retail, always in the digital space, of course, which is powered um, and uh, and everything around the digital space is powered through through data. So a love of data, the dance of da the dance of data, and uh, look forward to sharing with you how it intersects with beauty and, and retail. Lovely. I, I like that. We were trying to come up with the first data theory T-shirt. Now it's data theory dancing with data. <laughs> Look at that. He's a marketing guy. He doesn't even know it. Uh, first of all, my name is Kirk Dunn, and I just want to thank all of you for coming, even though maybe it's obvious that every minute of our day intersects what we do and how we interact with data from booking an airline ticket to a reservation to communicating with friends or sending a photo. But, um, you know, as the inaugural seminar for this, you are the mavericks in this area at UCLA. So, I'm going to remember your faces, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that you're all here to, to listen to us talk about what we've been doing the last 20 years that has resulted in this. I'm a UCLA grad. I graduated in 1983 with an applied math degree and spent most of my life in uh, Silicon Valley tech companies. I'm an early stage entrepreneur. Translate that to unemployed. So whenever you hear that, you know, it's a, it's a very sexy title, but it really is not that sexy. It's a lot of work. But anyway, thank you again for coming. My name is Sonali Sun, and um, I, I don't know how I became a data scientist. I started off my career uh, being a PhD student in applied statistics, and then I was doing a, conf uh, a presentation and someone at Microsoft said, you should come and do that at Microsoft. And that's where my career in tech started. So since then, I worked at Microsoft. I worked at Amazon looking at um, trying to grow out something called the cloud. And back then, it was a bunch of um, data centers that were building out and trying to scale. Um, worked at AWS and then came to Los Angeles to start um, to join a small startup um, on Venice Beach. It was called Snapchat. <laughs> worked there for seven years, uh, loved it. It was incredible to work for a company that really grew from a beach house on the beach to uh, generating over a billion dollars a year in revenue and building incredible products. And then uh, in the last year, uh, in the last five months, actually, I just joined Pinterest. Um, so it's been in tech at this point for over 15 years, um, different t and seen it evolve and change and their ups and downs. Um, and now in this field of data science, which I've been doing apparently for the last 15 years. <laughs> Little did you know. Yes. All right. So uh, I'm Sandeep Basin. I lead our global data and analytics function within Capital Group. Uh, Capital Group's uh, a firm that's really focused on helping people save for retirement uh, based in LA. 
Um, and so a little background, uh, my history, I, my, coming out of college, I worked in consulting for a number of years and really started in the consumer credit space, um, left consulting, went to GE Capital, still stayed in the consumer credit business, but very close to data, um, helped look at a, a variety of how customers' data should be analyzed and, and used for business decisions, very close to what we're going to talk about today. Left there and went to J.P. Morgan Chase um, and led a consumer credit analytics function um, and then came out to L.A. about seven and a half years ago, uh, Capital Group, and really started to help transform capital the way they should use data, primarily for sales, marketing, product, data, analytics. Um, and really what the heart of what, we're, what I'm focused on is really educating business leaders around Capital Group on how data can actually change the way they make decisions, um, but also innovating with data and helping drive new business outcomes. So um, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of that in the conversation, but um, really thanks for all of you attending today. Great. So uh, now we'll hear from the panelists with a few prepared remarks, and we'll start with uh, Michael. Sure. So I, I think that, you know, curiosity is, is uh, very, very important. Um, understanding how things work around you, understanding how things fit together. Uh, and more and more, there are these things called sensors, uh, things like cameras and uh, phones that, and applications and computers and et cetera, et cetera, and appliances and bathtubs and sinks that start collecting data around you, right? So all, all, of, um, all of your experiences um, you know, have a very um, positive way of impacting uh, decisions that you make, uh, as well as um, positive impact towards your community. So, you know, data theory for me represents an ability to interact with data in a way that allows you to uh, make that positive contribution and that positive impact. Um, for yourself, for your community, and the world. So not to be existentialist here, but the, the power of data and the program here um, from the math and statistics department really focuses on, really focuses on um, the thinking, the thought process, and the solutions behind a lot of these, um, a lot of these problems that were um, currently thinking about. The tools may not change a lot, the ability to implement uh, may not change a lot, but you now have a lot of tools and a lot of ready-made uh, ways to implement these solutions as a, as, as a data theory major to really leverage current ways for compute, current ways for math, current ways for algorithms. You know, not too long ago, you had to write your own libraries to do machine learning. Now you just upload your data to a platform, have it run it, run the data against a number of uh, algorithms, and you pick which one you want to implement with, three more buttons, button clicks, and it's there. So this ability to really accelerate what you can do in this space, um, to me, is really represented uh, very, very exactly by what the data theory um, curriculum uh, is supposed to do. So it kind of takes away the distractions of, you know, is it Java, is it Python, is it, is, it, uh, is it SQL? The answer is probably yes to all of that, but that's not the focus. The focus is on, are you gonna graduate from this program with the skills? Doesn't matter what the languages are, with the skills to think through using your math and statistics expertise, and a lot more data than you ever, ever think you need, um, plus 10 times that, to be able to solve those problems. So, you know, I think the timing is, is great. You know, when Kirk approached all of us uh, to participate in this, you know, timing's great to um, actually be able to share some industry experience and to give, give you, the students, an ability to really look at how this, uh, how, how this thing called data theory um, can map out a lot of things. So anyway, 
Thanks. Um, I will share a little bit about how data intersects at Ulta Beauty, and I'm, I'm probably a perfect example of someone that didn't grow up in the data science field and yet has such a deep respect and appreciation for um, the light that it shines on key business decisions, whether they're direct in terms of decisioning that we do for our consumers or whether it's key uh, you know, questions that we have in terms of choices we have to make, what direction do we go in, and uh, how, how important the field and insights, um, and most importantly, the actions driven by the insights of data scientists uh, are in terms of our day-to-day -day business operations. So first, digital. Digital in, uh, in, uh, at Alta Beauty is a e-commerce and team that runs our site and our app. Um, all of our digital touch points, uh, e uh, marketing touch points that as consumers you know about, whether it's email or a display ad or social media advertising. So just think of all things merchandising, marketing. Um, so that's one part of the digital team. Another part of the digital team is all about product development. And within product development come, is a huge intersection of data and technology. Um, folks that are helping create the new digital experiences that show up on your mobile devices. Um, then we have a digital innovation team uh, driven primarily with focus of AI and AR. Um, you know, we think about the use cases around data from, from a beauty perspective or from a beauty journey perspective, and no different than in many retail companies, um, the idea of choice, of navigating a large selection of product, of uh, finding those concerns and finding the right answer for you um, is something that data science can actually really help with. Um, and so there's a data, a digital innovation team that's primarily focused in those areas. And then we have a strategic analytics team whose core function um, is to solve key business questions. So that just gives you a sense of like inside of a company like Ulta Beauty, um, which you might just think of as, you know, eyeshadow and makeup and lipstick, um, you know, behind the scenes inside of the company, there are teams like this, of which is multi, in, it's interdisciplinary. There are merchants and marketers and uh, technology and project managers and finance team members, um, but connected through all of that, powering both our internal operations and our external experiences uh, are, is, is data. Um, so just the importance of that. Um, but I will just tell you a little bit, um, at least my personal opinion, I'd be curious what the rest of the panel thinks, is um, companies still haven't cracked the code <laughs> on how to pull all the data together. Um, so those that can help guide the way on that uh, is a you know highly valuable um, you know need um, and a really strategic um, asset. Um, so there's just connecting data, making it accessible, um, so that you can create and solve problems, and is 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 still um, uh, still a huge need. Um, and then I would say everybody's got data. Like who doesn't have data at this point? So data in and of itself is just data. <laughs> Um, so in, in our case, we're trying to think about, well, what is specific and differentiated and unique about our data set relative to other data sets? What is our data set missing that might be helpful from a contextual perspective to help us answer some of the questions we're doing? So, so I would say I would leave you with those three, you know, three thoughts. One is uh, just have a sense of how data powers everything internally and even externally with our consumers, even though it might not always be visible. Um, the second is, while we've made, we've come such a long way on this journey and this dance that Michael talks about, uh, trust me, companies are having a hard time with the complexity of connecting data, making it accessible, scaling it, and using it. Um, and the third thing is, uh, assuming that you can help make that happen, then uh, identifying what is differentiated in that data set that can help you unlock a unique insight that gives you competitive advantage is a lot of what you know our data scientists are, are focused on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's outstanding. So I'm going to dovetail on. Yeah, worth it. Very good. <clears throat> on um, Michael's comment about curiosity and Prama's comment about data is everywhere. If you think back to industry, back, you know, go back to the 30s, 40s, and 20s, data was always at the core of the business because you had two points of data. You had the customer, what they decided, and you had the product people, what they decided to build. What has occurred over time is all the other functions of data are there to kind of support those two things, selling and building. So analytics showed up because it was like, okay, we built this car, Henry Ford. Who's buying it? Why are they buying it? How many are they buying? The problem was the time gap and the amount of data to get 
back to the factory in, in time to change the product was years. Well, think about it today. It's milliseconds today. And so we are literally, in the, to use a baseball analogy, in the first inning of an existing industry. It's been around a long time. There's, there's been plenty of marketing people that have forever had tons of questions about all of us as consumers or users or buyers. The challenge was the compute environment wasn't there to allow us to ask those interesting questions at scale for free, right? It was expensive. You, you had a DBA, one of the founders at Cloudera that I was a chief operating officer of said he would, at Yahoo, one of the early data companies, he would say, well, I want to know why people that are using Yahoo Mail are doing these things. And the DBA was a database administrator, for those of you who don't know, the, the folks with the gray hair understand the, what that is, <laughs> would say, well, what problem are you trying to solve? And he would say, well, I'm not sure. I have an idea. I have a conjecture about something. Well, then I'm going to spend four months writing this schema, and you're not even sure? Like, are you kidding me? Today, that same job can get done in minutes at a marginal cost of zero. So now the questions that latent marketing people have always been wanting to ask are available. Well, here's the challenge that Prom is talking about is you've got to have clean data. You've got to have filtered data. You have to have commingled data. What if you're making the wrong assumptions about the hypothesis you're running into? And so what's exciting to me about data theory and why it's so important that is rigorous mathematical and statistical origins is because if at the core you do it wrong, then the answer at the end is miles off the correct answer. We know this, right? So it's a fascinating thing that these questions that have wanted to be asked for centuries have been out there. Now we have the compute power. Now hopefully we'll have the rigor around deep statistical and math theory so that when we do the analysis and ask the questions, we're doing it you know, with a green light. We're doing it the right way then the answers that start to emerge about buyers, users, consumers are, are going to be very clear. Unfortunately, what we hear mostly in the world today is in the social media area, right? You hear all these statistics about how people are making decisions and, you know, influencers and blah, blah, blah. Well, we also know, what do we know now too? There's a lot of bots out there. Well, that's called dirty data. So should we conclude anything from that? Maybe, maybe not. So, my encouragement to this group is we are literally in inning one of what, re, what, the, what the power of data theory is going to do to transform business. The questions are there. I just don't think we have the expertise yet. And I, matter of fact, I know we don't have the expertise yet in these companies. We don't have enough Sonalis. We don't have enough Promise. We don't have enough people like Michael that made his way from chemical engineering into the data world and Sandeep, who understands consumer behavior probably better than... 99.9% .9 of consumer products people. So this, this opportunity for this major, I think, is really paramount. I think it's going to really transform UCLA's imprint. And the hope is, and Mark said this really the right way, to be the leader and to make a difference in actually how the proper data theory, which results in good data science, is done in industry. And, we'll, and hopefully the university will get known for producing those kinds of professionals that will be, and he said it right, leaders in this industry. So I think it's thrilling, but tons of opportunity. I don't even know what I can add. That's so inspiring. I would have to say that, you know, what comes to mind is our, I manage about 50 data scientists across five different teams, and our part of the organization is just data scientists. And I say just data scientists because at Pinterest, we have a 300-person machine learning team, and then we have another 50-person uh, data engineering team. So collectively together, that's all data science, or so that all used to be a single profession data science. I say used to be because today at Pinterest, at, at Snapchat, we have started to differentiate what you are learning today in data theory to be more than just data science. We have people who have to understand algorithms who can pr produce production ready uh, code that scales as efficient so that we could process terabytes of data, uh, design deep learning models to produce estimates, probabilities on certain actions that, that users will take. We need to under, uh, create efficient 
pipelines uh, that, that can um, accommodate new and changing data sources. And then we have the data scientists themselves that sit in the middle. Um, I'll read to you the data science um, mission statement uh, that our team has. It's, we're strategic thought partners who enable improved product understanding and better decision making using scientific methodology and deep data exploration. Mm -hmm. And that, it took us a whole day to figure out what makes us different now that we have data engineering and we have machine learning engineers. What is a data scientist? What does that mean anymore? Aren't we just machine learning engineers? But actually, what we're finding is that data scientists differentiate themselves by not just being good at coding. At least that's how I became a data scientist. I was a statistician who also knew R and knew uh, Python. Mm -hmm. um, but you also understand statistics, and that's still important. Mm -hmm. Understanding causal inference is critical. Figuring out confounders in a decision-making process is often overlooked when you have machine learning engineers who don't understand the theory, um, just putting the kitchen sink into data sources um, and trying to figure out how to optimize parameters. What also matters is ethics, because I like that line in the video that talks about robots. Your, your job is not to build a robot. Your job is not even to, it, it is to figure out like what did the robot do and how can we make it better. But it's also to teach the robot through reinforcement learning to take its own actions, right? And to create experiments, to design experiments, to make sure that we make the right decisions over time when it's actually in the real world. A lot of what data scientists do is to create experimentation processes, causal inference. Uh, the scientific method becomes so critical. Otherwise, when you empower um, engineers <laughs> like myself with data, we use descriptive analytics to go make a decision. There are repercussions uh, that, that really um, have impact on a personal level. So thinking about the, the implications from an ethical perspective on the decisions we make is a, a, an important role that data scientists play today. Um, it becomes even more important when you think about uh, the assumptions we make about people when we make decisions in, so it seems benign, like I'm showing an ad, I'm trying to figure out what's the best ad to show, but what am I assuming about you? What information have I taken mm -hmm. about you in, in the world and that I've collected about you throughout everything that you've done, whether you've opted in or not, maybe you don't realize what you've done, um, but, but we do, right? And that's scary, and that can be nefarious. And so it's up to you to figure out what's the right decision-making um, process we, could, uh, we can make in the future that's privacy-centric, that's safe, while also has the engine roaring from a revenue perspective and making the right product decisions. All right, so um, maybe, you know, very consistent, I think, a little bit with where I think where Prama was going and Sonali. Um, maybe, but before I, we get into the, the similarities, I, may, I thought I'd start with just explaining a little bit about, like, what does a data and analytics function at Capital Group look like? So, uh, effectively, the team that I oversee has five major focus areas. Uh, one is really, I just think of it as the plumbing. It's the data foundation, and you know I think Prama mentioned that you know that sometimes just getting the right data, the clean data, is, is really important. We have a team just really focused on how do we build all the right data sets so that we can actually get outcomes from the data, clean data. Um, the second sort of area is really around data governance. It gets to ethics. It gets to what does the data really mean, and data quality, like putting in processes to check the data to make sure when it gets downstream into business decisions, um, the integrity is really there. Um, the third area that uh, we look at is, is really customer research. And so it's more of the qualitative data, but it's surveys, it's focus groups. How do we find out information from cons our consumers or um, advisors in our case, because we deal with a lot of wealth advisors. Um, and so that's, that's another sort of data set and, and set of data that we consume and use to, make, um, to recommend insights. Uh, the, th the, f the fourth area is really around business intelligence, business insights. It's really around... Um, doing some th typical reporting, but also kind of translating that into clear insights for business leaders to make decisions on. Uh, and that comes in a number of different forms, but management reporting in your day-to-day -day on specific clients uh, and what our clients are doing um, and, and the likes, some, similar, similar to that. And then the last area is data science. And we've talked about different variations of data science. Uh, within Capital Group, we're, we're still early in our journey on data science. 
Um, and, and we, you know, we're really focused on tangible use cases. And I'll get in a little bit of now maybe pivoting to like, how do we think about this um, in, within capital? And, and the, really the focus that we have is think of it as a pyramid. At the very bottom of the pyramid, it's the foundation. The next layer is really around enablement and taking that data and, and creating an uh, opportunity or ability to enable different business processes or data-driven programs. And then the top of the pyramid is really around creating new value. And that's really around thinking of specific use cases. And maybe I can give one or two, and I'll maybe I'll focus on one. And we call it the traveling salesman. And so a lot of what our business is, is talking to uh, either investors or advisors around um, products that we sell. And you know, in order for us to make that sales force the most efficient that they can be, you know, we do a lot of data science, a lot of data mining around you know, who, where they should go from a drive time perspective. So actually mapping their route for them to make it easier for them to save time in the day. Or it could be thinking of who likes to be talked to on the phone versus who wants to be seen in person based on past history. Or looking for trends around that client's behavior. Are they selling or are they buying in different patterns? Uh, those are a lot, some examples. And we take all that data in and we make recommendations to our sales force. And that's a real big part of like, I would consider our use case around the traveling salesman. There's others that we have around digital and a little bit where Promo went on digital targeting. And I think that's the practicality using all the data we can consume to help us with real outcomes that our business can take action on. If I think about the data science role and, and how important it is and how it's evolving so much within our business and just thinking about when we bring a data scientist into capital, you know, we, we think of they're coming in with a set of skills and we need to kind of add to that. And so all, of, all everything you'll learn in university and what you see in day to day in your life, you know, we try to say enhance that technical of what you, what you know and, and add to it. I think where we can actually starting to create competitive advantage is, is help, helping those data scientists learn more about the business. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a layer of just technical skill and depth, but then learning about our business and we teach each of the data scientists more about every part of our business. And we think that's one way for us to differentiate. Um, and then having them learn about the depth of the data. So all the different data sets and, and thinking about everything that they can consume to kind of think about what problems can they solve with that data. And then ensuring that they're thinking about data governance and data quality and everything they do. And so if I think about like, what does the typical data scientist, how they spend their time, you know, we pro they probably spend 40% of their time cleaning data and actually manipulating it for use at least in, in from our perspective because of where we are in our maturity curve. 40% is really around creating algorithms, models, predictive analytics, and then 20% is around communication. And I think that's super important to help explain um, why, should they be, why should business leaders be using data to make different decisions? What, what's new about it from their old process to their new process? And that takes a lot of time and effort to actually learn the right way to communicate about data. I think that's super important. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, just to, to kind of summarize a little bit, I, I, would, I would recommend everybody thinking about it. It's a little bit where Sonali went is where you see where data is being used in your day to day. And it's everywhere. And a lot of places collect data. Others use it, consume it, and then actually do something with it. And there's a lot of different opportunities. Data is being uh, created so rapidly today. Um, just so think about that in your day to day and how you might use that data if you had a, a problem to solve. What, what, how can that data help you? And I think the data theory opportunity ahead for all of you is it helps you think about the practicality of that. It'll help train you for the real, real world and, and, and for companies like um, Capital or others. Um, it's, there's an immense opportunity in the market and I think it's such an evolving field that um, just leave you with, take that opportunity to learn about it and, and, um, and, and grow from there. Okay, the next stage of the program is a question uh, and answer. There's a floating mic. If you put up your hand, the mic will be brought to you to ask the question. This is, this is what you call AMA, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, 25 years ago, the Federal Trade Commission started protecting children under 12 from various deceptive marketing platforms and, and strategies. 
Um, and more recently, Juul, for example, was not allowed to have colorful images and, and advertise their uh, fruit flavors in, in their nicotine products. For me, as an aspiring data scientist, I find that I often have to sacrifice some of my ethical standards, especially for the intro jobs, um, especially in the social media sector, which, in my opinion, is often a for-profit experiment in marketing on young people. How can I not sacrifice my ethical standards in uh, my first job as a data scientist? Just say no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are bright lines you should say no. Can I answer this? Because I thought yeah, yeah. this is very pertinent, and every day we're, at, we're dealing with those kind of questions. Um, I would say that in, retros in hindsight, things are obvious, that, oh, you shouldn't do this or that. Sometimes the government, ma government makes it very obvious because they're say, they say, hey, don't, don't show alcohol ads to anyone under 18. Easy. We could create very clear thresholds and rules to do that. But then there are those sketchy areas. And I would say that most, I'm not going to say most, the companies that I've worked for, they want to do the right thing. We're all humans, and we're all trying to really advocate for the right decisions and right policies. And that trade-off between doing the right thing versus the consequence or implication to revenue or DAU, daily active users, uh, user growth, is always going to be attention. And the way a data scientist can navigate that is by collecting the right data and figuring out the right, in my opinion, I think communication matters, but creating the right narrative from a data perspective. What is the case for? What is the case against? What are the implications of it? For example, one of the things that we've really um, created is a culture of launch reviews and experimentation um, and creating long running holdouts, meaning we have uh, a series of people who don't see a certain experience or don't see ads, for example. And we see what, what, what happened when we actually did not monetize from this group of people. Um, how much did we lose? Actually, it turns out we increase engagement because nobody likes, likes ads. I hate ads. I would use a product more if that happened. And that helps the business. And again, the business knows this, is that we have a more nuanced conversation. It's not a black and white conversation. It rarely is. But we don't have the right data to talk about it, or we don't have the right experiments or causal inference techniques to actually make those determinations. So from a data science perspective, if you're lucky enough to be in a situation where we can create the right models and um, uh, right arguments and um, launch review processes where everyone's in the room and there's an open and transparent and active debate about product launch decisions, that's a good place to be. If you're in a situation where decisions are happening in isolation, product decisions are not happening in an open, transparent, collaborative manner, or data is missing, you should probably go to another company. <laughs> For a data scientist, that would be miserable. <laughs> Thank you. It may be just worth adding as well. I mean, is everyone here familiar with ESG? So I think, you know, free will, choice, choosing a company with the same values is very, very important. Um, and in the past, we didn't really have ESG. We're just starting to have that as, a, as an accurately measured metric. Um, Maybe define that for everybody who doesn't know it. So for those who don't know, ESG is environmental social governance metrics that public companies are measured against on how much they're able to uh, be very transparent. Things like carbon credits, things like diversity, things things like how they're transparent with how decisions are made for advertising. So every company now is required to public company uh, is required to really assess and provide transparency on how they do this. And you know, for you know, mutual funds, for example, there, there's now ESG ratings that. Uh, that show you how much companies are actually um, uh, making decisions based on environmental impact, social impact, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's, that's something that's just transforming how companies govern themselves.
Thanks. My question is for Sandeep. What's your view on how data can be used in the asset management industry on the investment side, not just the marketing and operations? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we're we're using data, data every day. You know, there's a number of different ways of, of how we're starting to think about using data in the investment process. Part of it is is to analyze uh, consumer behavior to know how it might impact a company. So, looking at what are the patterns or you know purchase behavior, um, assessing companies like just take Netflix for example. If they're going to do a pricing change, um, that might be something that where we're going to actually go do some research on that. Then we might kind of look at you know a, a, the history of the company. Might look at like their their um, you know user base and uh, different information we can get on that. Uh, that's one example. I think there's others, many others that where um, we'll look at sectors. So if you want to see where um, and even like you can you geospatial information. So an example with Best Buy, for example, you can look at their parking lots and see how many cars are in the parking lot and the traffic you're seeing there. Those are examples of data sets you can are being created today. Lots of I think companies are doing that. Those can be consumed and help you decide. Okay, well, that, are they going to hit their revenue targets? Um, you know, so those are a couple examples of of ways that that asset managers are starting to do that. There's other things that Michael mentioned around ESG. Um, that's an area. It's a newer area of focus for us where we're we're consuming data around companies and their ESG priorities, and that might be a factor in decision making. Uh, it's not necessarily pure data science, but it's, it's, there's a variety of different data being created nowadays, nowadays there, some of it which will be data science, but some of it is just more macro information on companies. Um, you know, and then we're, we're also looking at how you can use natural language processing to actually read uh, companies, um, their investor day in, information, and mine that text, or it could be their um, annual reports or their financial statements. So there's a lot there that you can use uh, machine learning to actually mine the data and, and save the analyst time for uh, what they might spend hours reading. So those are just some examples of how we're starting to think about the use of data science in the investment process, uh, but we're still early in that journey. I was going to say there's, there's even some uh, HR applications out there where <clears throat> they'll videotape the candidate and with a high degree of accuracy, you can tell whether the person's embellishing or even lying. Mm -hmm. Or you can actually scan a resume and you can do a machine learning algorithm on it and find out what's actually factual versus what is not. So there's some very, very interesting kind of what I would call, you know, maybe uh, broad gray lines on ethics, you know, in a sense, depending on which side of it you're on. Should you evaluate somebody that closely with, via video? Well, if they're lying and you're hiring for, you know, military or police officer, you might want to know that stuff. So, again, in many, many ways, there's all sorts of these applications that are out there that are, you know, kind of on the ethics line a little bit as well to kind of connect to the previous point. It's fascinating stuff. And maybe just, just also talking about hedge funds, right, for investments. Uh, one of my closest friends is CTO, one of the hedge funds that... Um, I think they hope they 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 execute 33% of the trades every day in the market just because it's no longer people analyzing data and trading against that right so the data scientists or what we used to call quants mm -hmm. would write uh, will figure out an alpha right which is an advantage against the rest of the market usually these have short li short lives right days sometimes where they can find an opportunity uh, to trade in milliseconds a lot of money um, and be able to use that so the what we used to what we used to know as a, uh, as a stock broker then a trader then a quant right it looks a lot like a data scientist or a data theory major these mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. right and um, it's no longer people making trades it's now ideas of data theory uh, uh, graduates that are now powering all of these, uh, all of these trades. So. Yeah, and, and the massive cohort of data, you know, like Sandeep's example, one of our customers was one of those that does satellite imagery for retail. So now you're quant, you're not just analyzing the traditional financial data to make your arbitrage decision, you're actually integrating all sorts of new data you never had before. Some is text, some is natural language audio, some is video, and boom, you're making millisecond decisions that is moving the market one way or the other. 
little bit, a little big brotherish, right? A little scary in some respects, but it's the way it's going. Um, so I guess um, a lot of decisions are now derived, derived, driven by data. But I'm just curious. Before all the machine learning techniques and everything, if you want to procure data, if if you're procuring data from your own business within your organization, I guess always having a good data collection algorithm and procedures is a good thing. But then what if you sometimes rely on third parties and then other data procuring or agents outside? I'm just curious, how do you make sure the quality that you, the, the data that you purchase or obtain is a good quality? And are there any pro protocols that businesses follow in order to address that. You should probably know. That's a great I was going to say, well, I don't know. We, we actually don't purchase much third-party data. Um, we use it for really basic fundamentals like addresses and cleaning addresses every month or, um, you know, basic cleansing household, you know, household data type techniques. Um, but most of our data uh, and, and, and how we're capturing it intentionally um, is through our loyalty program. And for us, uh, we have the privilege of 95% of our transactions running through uh, our loyalty program. And that gives us first party data. Now, do we need to augment with external data? A lot of times we'll use publicly available data. Um, and uh, but I don't, I don't personally, we are not personally a company that is purchasing a lot of third party data. Now we do partner with other um, agencies and third, third, third parties that have their own data sets. Um, and from there, while we don't have access to what data sets they're using, for example, to target what we do is uh, a little bit of what Sonali talked about, test and control and performance um, to indicate whether we're, we're reaching and, and meeting the expectations that we have. And then from there, we can infer that the, their, their data sets and quality of their data are, are sound, but there's really nothing we can do directly to look at their third party data and, and, and assess that. Um, and it's just not a practice that we're using that much. I can I can talk a little bit about it. We do use a lot of third party data, um, and you know I, I mentioned earlier in when I, some of my opening remarks were early on that data quality is a, it's a really important part of the process for us. Um, you know, so what we'll do is a we there's some level of trust you have to have with the third parties, but um, what we built on top of that is you know we'll look at patterns in the in, in the data over time. So we'll keep the history. We'll have anomaly detection. Has that changed? you know, out of, out of tolerance. And so we'll have tolerance checks that will flag, hey, this data set looks off. You know, there's also just looking at is there data, is there empty, you know, fields in the data. So there's there's a variety of different checks you can do. Um, and I think that's a core part of uh, processing third-party data. Um, there's also like, you know, that how do you kind of work on um, with the actual third parties themselves to kind of get them to build rigor into their process. And so we've had to spend time with vendors and third parties to actually improve their data collection and data transfer processes. So I think there's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's something that I, nobody's got perfect. You know, I was talking to Michael a little bit about, you know, he's been helping um, a company consult on, on processing third-party data. And so, Michael, you might want to talk a little bit about that, but um, there's, there's really an opportunity ahead for a lot of companies who don't have standards in their data to allow others to kind of help them with best practices and, and you know, uh, getting companies that specialize in this to kind of improve it. Because I'd say that there's a lot of infancy in people who are trying to monetize their data, and that's an opportunity ahead in the market, I think. So I don't know, Michael, if you want, or Sonali. Sorry, know. just yeah. to, yeah, go for it. I, I do want to add on that, that um, in terms of monetizing data, um, that industry is changing. And so I think in the last eight years, we, a lot of, companies that that rely heavily on digital advertising to be their primary revenue, um, you could only validate whether there's something called attribution, right? So you only get paid for what uh, what um, you, you've contributed in terms of uh, an end purchase. So if I went to Alta Beauty and I bought that piece of makeup, um, a, a lipstick, um, did they do it because they saw an ad on Pinterest or on Snapchat or on Facebook or on somewhere else? And so attribution really matters. And the way that a lot of these companies try to try to prove that it was me, it was like that user come to my website that caused that caused 
uh, from a causal inference perspective, caused you to go purchase that lipstick at Ulta Beauty, um, we rely on third-party data to do that. Um, but that is a, a field that's changing over time. It was easy because there are so many arbiters in this space, in this space collecting information uh, on individuals, um, and it was easy for. Uh, and there's a lot of um, overlap, so it was easy to validate that information because you would have an individual user that you could track by IP address or address, a physical address, email address, whatever it is, and you can very easily validate whether that person exists or whether that information is real or not, and you always have some error term around it. But now, that is not no longer the case. You can't sell and buy individual um, identifier information as easily, and that's going to change dramatically in the next at least in the next 10 to 15 years, at least, I imagine, um, where there are significant changes happening on, on personal data. And so from an advertising perspective, we've really heavily relied on third-party data and third-party information about users. And so I'm in, very interested to see from a data science perspective how we will evolve um, monetizing um, the social networks without relying on third-party data. A lot of our work, like literally today, we're trying to figure out how can we infer inf behaviors or information about people who have opted out mm -hmm. of sharing that data. And that's a, that's a world that we're gonna have no ground truth in. So ground truth matters, but when we don't have that, what does that mean? And that's surprising, I, I assume, where you think you have first party information. <coughs> when we were at Amazon, it was easy. You have the full funnel, but Facebook, Pinterest, Snapchat, Instagram, all those places rely on attribution and third party data. Fascinating. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Devin Ree. Uh, this question is for the entire panel. I'm curious, how has your thinking around pursuing, accepting, or even declining opportunities evolved over time? How did you weigh things when you were starting a career versus what do you weigh now? Can I answer that question? Because I think I started off my career in ads at, at Microsoft, and I was like, I hate this. I don't want to do ads ever. And so I went off to you know AWS and doing things like that. But now I'm back in ads for about eight years, because that was where all the exciting ML was happening. You don't get to like actually. You don't need to know exactly um, how to have like the most precise and accurate probability estimates in any other part of the business, but in ads, you need to get that right. And that was fun and exciting. But now, I would definitely go and do something that has a positive impact on society, because um, I, it's really evolved and changed. I, like, I wish I could do something good in, in the world, and I, I don't think ads brings that. <laughs> but you should, you should come join for my work on my team, though. This is a great team. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I think there, there is a trade-off in terms of like, ha solving really hard problems, and then having the ability to do that in the real world and see immediate results, it's amazing. You could probably do that in finance, too, right? Uh, but it's it's really exciting to do that, but you know, I don't know if I'm the rest of my career is going to be that because you're not solving you're not saving lives or doing anything like that. <laughs> I mean, I would I would say that you, you know, applied math, which is you know data theory or statistics or math applied. Go find a field that you really are passionate about, and like I said earlier, that if data underpins everything we do and it always has, whether it was Henry Ford building a car, or it was the space program, or it was the study of science, or it was the study of electricity. The data, the experimentation with data was, was what resulted in the answers. So what's exciting about data theory is you, UCLA will graduate many undergrads that can literally apply it to psychology, geospatial science, economics, trading in Wall Street, ads, anything you want it to. because if the underpinning of all decision making in business and in science and technology is what's the data tell us? You know, whether people say the data doesn't lie. So whatever you may think, you gotta test it against the data and the data will tell you the answer. In fact, 
In many cases, the best data analytics people are those where they let the data tell them the question. So they might pivot their business because they realize they've been actually asking the wrong question all along. So I guess in conclusion there, I would say go find a, a field, an applied field that you love or that you're passionate about, whatever it is, and then go dedicate your life to it and be that data analytics person that brings answers and new questions to an industry that's never been able to do that before. That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello, a question for uh, Ms. Sun. Um, you mentioned that you'd worked for Snapchat before and Pinterest now. How important is it in your work to interact with those programs? So when you work for Snapchat, were you actually using Snapchat? And do you use Pinterest now? Thank you. Yeah, 100%. You have to use the products. And, and going back to Kurt, you have to be passionate about the product or the space you're in and know what 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 is the behavior that's creating the data, what's the data genera generating process? Um, especially when it comes to product and product development, you have to understand um, what's the onboarding process look like. We had, at Snapchat, we had something, uh, we had our own app. And every time something was annoying or something broke or it crashed, we would shake it um, and it would file a bug. And that was one of the best features because the best people who use the product are employees. Mm -hmm. um, and data, the best data scientists absolutely are the ones who can ask questions about how, how does this line up to, it's not just data and just uh, creating descriptive statistics for a product manager to consume. It's what does this mean? Why is this happening? And how do I put this in the context of a funnel? And how should I create that? Um, it's critical. I would, and I would just add, um, you know, one of the most impactful things you can do is actually be thoughtful about the data signals that you're capturing. And the best way to think about that is if you're actually using the experiences. Uh, and and otherwise, you know, you, you can miss, uh, miss capturing really critical sets of data if you don't really understand the nuance and the details of the experience. So that data capture element that's thoughtful because you understand the user experience is a really critical part. And every si single one of those signals digitally <laughs> is an intent signal. Whoever was using it wanted to do something. And getting underneath that and being able to mine that insight is, is really, really powerful. Of course, to add to that, the funny thing is always when when the CEO is like, "I want a metric to I want to know how how to measure delight, or how do I measure inspiration?" And so that's really your job as uh, as a data scientist. <laughs> you have to go and try to figure out how I measure inspiration and how do I test for whether I'm delighting Snapchatters <laughs> through this lens, you know. And so the, creating metrics and trying to figure out the right tests and experiments to figure out whether is this delight, is this inspiration? Yeah, th this is going to sound sarcastic, but somehow they all go back to revenue. <laughs> 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 but I, I, I want to highlight um, what Sonali said about the experience. So as a data scientist, you, not me, I'm not a data scientist. But as data scientists, you really have to have that day in the life to understand. Mm -hmm. um, Starbucks is well known for this, right? They send their executives regularly to work the, the drive through window, understand how the customers are interacting. And the first-hand experience of a data scientist, there is no substitute for that. I worked for a private equity firm that owned uh, Safeway, Albertsons. Uh, I work, uh, they also own a fracking company, also own the second largest used car dealership in the country. And we would send our data scientists and data engineers to sit with the person that's buying the used cars, right? Live auction sites, 10 screens, buying, buying the same white Toyota Camry over and over again. And we're like, that's a problem. Um, how can we set up some algorithms to avoid that based on inventory? Um, fracking company sent sent uh, sent data scientists maybe five hours deep into uh, Pennsylvania where there's no uh, cell signal for hours at a time right where we would have to figure out how to send data over satellite right 10 megabit down 5 megabit up not much 
collect all of that data so that there could be, I know it's controversial sometimes, somewhat, I don't work for them anymore, but you know, c can you be more environmentally sound with your practices if you're collecting every uh, data point throughout that, uh, that chain of activities for that? Right, so you know, my employees look like Ghostbusters with the with the helmet and, and the the jumpsuit, but the, those experiences allowed them to think about problem solving in a different way than just reading about it or allowing other people to translate what that firsthand experience was. So, you know, don't care how junior you are in a role, you have to fight for that right to. Uh, not party. <laughs> I just realized <laughs> you have to fight for that right to have your own first-hand experience, or else, how are you going to solve that? <laughs> so that too, um, but yeah. Yeah. I stopped. By a show of hands, how many people really know that reference that Michael just made? Oh come on. Now, see, I, not many. Like, oh. yeah. See. Yikes. I'm from New York, so. It's just they're too young. Yeah. Here. Totally. Yeah. Beastie Boys. Mm -hmm. It's a song written by uh, Beastie, the Beastie Boys. The Beastie Boys. <laughs> you gotta fight for your right to party. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Data scientists in the house. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. Uh, I'm curious as a professionals dealing with, uh, you know, such diverse data-driven roles in your uh, different organizations, beyond the technical skill set, what's, what's the one or the few components that is personally important to you when picking a new hire or someone you would be working closely with, uh, especially on an entry level or in an entry level role or even beyond that, that, you know, as individuals who are going to be entering the workforce in the next uh, two or three years could really uh, be honing in on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe I'll start and then whoever else wants to add in. I'd say, you know, obviously the technical is really important and, and having that aptitude. We typically will do some sort of case study, give a, a, a use case, an example, potentially even a data set as part of that. But I'd say two other things that we'll really look for is intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, what sort of questions do you ask? What, what are the, you know, like, where does your interest go in the conversation? Are you able to like, kind of hold a very good conversation in that way? And then I think communication ties to that. Like, how good are you at expressing your thoughts or, you know, explaining a, an answer to a problem or, you know, thinking, you know, about different topics and, and being able to actually articulate that um, very well. So I think those are, you know, outside of the technical domain, those are a couple others that we look at. And, and there's others as well, but that just gives you a couple examples. I would echo those too, and I think just to just to layer one more on would would be um, this ability to translate the work that you're doing into a consumer lens or a user lens or a uh, an, an end state or an outcome lens, and that that translation um, and interest, not just the ability to do it, uh, is really really critical. Um, yeah, I think. After we've hired data scientists, the ones that are successful their first year as an entry data scientist are the ones that can write well. Mm. Um, I am biased. I come from Amazon, and so we write papers. We write one pagers, three pagers, five pagers. It is critical to know how to write um, well and succinctly using the active voice. Um, case for, case against. What are your metrics for success, and did it occur? And being able to do that in a way that anyone who's not familiar with your analysis can understand it. Can Jeff Bezos read this and understand what happened? Mm -hmm. And he hasn't been deeply involved in your space. Okay. So written communication really matters. Um, and then impact, I'm figuring out, I'm, I'm working on this for three months, what is the impact of this gonna be? How do I measure that? Mm -hmm. We have something called OKRs, but what, 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 what am I actually trying to move from doing this analysis? I think data scientists, unfortunately, sometimes get um, put into a world where we're just doing analytics and sometimes you're wondering, well, what, what, Why? what's the point? Yeah, I'm just gathering data. Mm -hmm. What role do I play in this organization? And those are organizations you don't want to be in. You, you want to be the ones that say, hey, what is the impact of the work that you're going to do? What are you driving? You're working collaboratively with the PM, a uh, product manager, an engineering manager, and together you're, you can move a metric. So someone, uh, I think those are the two, two things that really create successful data scientists. Yeah, I would agree that, so I, I would go with curiosity if I had to pick one. 
uh, because I think all of it emanates from that. And I'll give you a technique, which uh, an old VP of engineering that worked for me used to use. And we've all been there where you're in this heated discussion and it's this monumental decision and there's for and against and there's all this data. And then all of a sudden somebody says, what problem are we trying to solve? (laughs) And then the entire room goes quiet. Because typically we've conflated a bunch of ideas. We all think we're talking about the same idea. And on the margin we are, but at the core we're not. And that one person that's got the curiosity, intellectual, and also maybe courage is in there too. Even young people. I always say, you know, respect your boss, but make them earn it. Right? (laughs) To be able to say, how many, it's like the dumb question in class. Like you're sitting back there and the professor's going on, Mark's going on and on about something, and you're like, excuse me, what are you talking about? But most of us don't do it. Why? Because it's socially awkward, right? We don't want to be the one that everybody goes, well, there's the idiot right there. He just exposed himself. I've done that quite a few times in my life. But it's so much better to do that because the problem-solving issue is so important in a company. And trust me, you get a bunch of high-powered, smart people in a room, and next thing you know, it's amazing how you kind of lose what you're really trying to get after. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So curiosity, then courage. To, and that's the tool. Ask the question, what problem are we trying to solve? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it'll be amazing that, and if you went down the row, you might get a varied answer. Mm-hmm. Well, how have we been arguing about this for an hour <laughs> when we don't even agree? Like, incredible. But, yeah. So... More question is one over there. Oh, question over there. Right. Oh, yeah, uh, this is just a question uh, for the entire panel. Um, so I was just kind of wondering about how companies are planning to address uh, issues of like data privacy in particular, uh, because we see now like mounting political pressure, especially on companies that use use their personal data to uh, drive insights for their products. Because we now see, for example, uh, in political campaigns using social media, uh, user data to weaponize uh, political ideas and propaganda to influence user behavior. So we see these kinds of uh, negative effects of of being able to access this user data for your own profitable gain. So uh, can uh, will companies address this potentially, or if will it require some kind of political in- intervention uh, to be able to address these issues? That's a big question. I mean, there are there are regulations yeah. out there now. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume any of us on our websites Absolutely. have uh, full access to where you can control and determine whether the company has access to your data or not. Um, whether you do or don't want to be opted in. So um, there are there are those controls starting now beyond what's being regulated. Um, I also think, like we talked about, uh, you know, companies with, with conscience and, and also focused on doing the right thing for their consumers are, are probably taking extra steps. But I would say, I don't, I don't know if yeah. others have uh, additional examples, but yeah. a yeah. lot of that is being Absolutely. heavily managed, regulated, and today. I mean, we've, we've just set up a, in the past year, you know, hired a, like a head of privacy, a privacy office, you know, so we're, we're being proactive about in Europe, there's GDPR, in the U.S., state by state CCPA. is regulating. You know, there's there's a lot going on there. And I think being very proactive on that and, and you know, there's lots of technical things you can do with your data to make sure it's privacy compliant. Um, so we're very focused on that. And then I think just most most brands are wanting to be transparent with how they use the data. And and ultimately, you know, the whole point is you're generating some kind of real value or, or love and so that the person using it is is willing um, to participate versus there's something, you know, suspect happening in terms of that. So I think that's kind of a key principle when we're when we're thinking about data and data privacy. Well, maybe one more question if it's brief. Yeah, hi. Um, first, I just wanted to say I just came out of a very theoretical math class, and I was wondering why the hell are we learning all this? I think this seminar has really put things into perspective. <laughs> <laughs> it really has shown like, it's, it's really important why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so thank you for that. This question is to Ms. Bott, but also to the whole panel. Um, there's a lot of appeal, especially for data scientists, about the big tech, the fang companies, especially, and you know, they try to go towards that because 
it is like the second best thing to software engineering and stuff like that. So I wanted to hear, especially um, for Ms. Bot, because of the Ulta beauty and how does data really influence that company? What do the data scientists do on a day to day? in your company? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, it all depends on what your interest is. We definitely want to make sure we have our data scientists having, uh, you know, the ability to engage with other data scientists and, and be empowered to think and solve through problems. Um, but for those that are interested in experiences, so for example, our data scientists are working on a skin analysis tool. And that skin analysis tool is uh, in our app now, but it's going through its iterations. But if you think about what's underneath it, it's uh, computer vision, it's image recognition, um, it's uh, you know creating data sets, um, and uh, not only the data sets that we already have, but thinking through what it means to have a diverse data set so that we have unbiased data. And so our data scientists are, are doing very similar things, but in service of hopefully uh, an experience in an app that's going to help um, a beauty enthusiast or a consumer track you know the redness of their skin or um, understand what they need to do if they have dark spots and ultimately ultimately with the intent of tracking that over time and then helping provide guidance on what product, even at the ingredient level. So we have a group of data scientists that are working on, you know, getting down to the ingredient level and understanding, um, you know, that level of connection when we think about a product recommendation versus just what somebody else bought, right? So I would say I'm just giving you two small examples to kind of get the juices going because I don't think we would probably be a premier location for somebody that's in the data science field, but there's a lot of cool things happening um, even in companies like ours that aren't centered around technology. And quite frankly, it's almost the opposite. There's such a strong need um, that the opportunity is really, really, is, is really, really big. Thanks. Wow, that, that was great. I think uh, we as you CLA people should thank and uh, welcome our Data Theory Advisory Board to UCLA.